Message today, but we are in a series entitled Supernatural Building, Supernatural Building. And we're looking at the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah built the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. Now, the walls were torn down for 100, over 100 years. They were trying to rebuild the walls for over 70 years. But Nehemiah did it in just 52 days, which is nothing short of supernatural. Amen. In week one, we said this. We said in week one that we pray this very powerful prayer. God, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? And when we have the heart of God, we can be used for his glory. Amen. And so we're asking the Lord, Lord, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? Lord, would you give me your eyes to see people, God, the way you see people? Then in week two, we realized and we understood that, man, we have the favor of the King of kings and the Lord of lords on our life. Just as Nehemiah was given favor to go build the walls, the King of kings has now given us favor to build as well. Last week, Pastor Eric, our founding pastor, brought a message, and he, uh, I just want to encourage you, if you are a business leader of any type or leader in any sphere or you're looking to start a business, uh, man, I encourage you, go back if you missed it to take a look at that message. Man, matter of fact, uh, I encourage you if, if you, if that is you, go back and listen to it again. There's so many incredible nuggets of wisdom in that message. Now, this morning... Uh, what we're talking about, because of small group fair, I, was, I wrote a message on Monday, and I was like, man, this is really great for building community, everybody getting back involved with small groups as a small group semester kicks off. And I was like, man, this is going to be great. I'm excited about everybody getting involved with one another and getting and finding a group and all that. And then on Wednesday afternoon, I just felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and said, scratch it. <laughs> that ever happened to you before? Change it. And I knew in the moment that God was telling me to write something different. And there's one scripture I'm about to share with you in a moment that really bothers me, that kind of got to me. And I feel like the Lord really has this for this house this morning. Let me, uh, let me kind of read, let me read this to start off. And I want to just say this too, that, you know, this morning I speak this message in love. I speak this message this morning from a place of, man, I don't have it all figured out. I've got growth in this area as well. Let's read this together, Nehemiah 2, verse 17. It says this, then I said to them, this is Nehemiah speaking. He's a, about to speak to the leaders in Jerusalem. He says this, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that we had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. This is an incredible moment right here. Nehemiah comes before the leaders and he says, hey, the walls are down. They have been burned. We're in trouble. Let's be above reproach. Let's build the walls. Let's come together. And so everyone in that moment, they answered the call and they said, yes, let's build. Let's arise and let's build for the glory of God. But there, what bothers me more than anything else, though, what I'm about to read, it's not that there was opposition during this building time. It's not that there was manipulation from the outside to build the walls towards Nehemiah, what bothers me is, is this verse right here. So everyone came together, everyone was building, everyone was a part of it, but look at verse five. Next to them, the Tukites made repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. So everyone came together to build, except for the nobles. There's one group of people that missed out on this supernatural building. There's one group of people that missed out on what God was doing. Why? Because of their pride. Their pride got in the way of the opportunity to build supernaturally for the glory of God. They thought they were too good. They didn't have to do it. Everyone else came together to build except for that one group of people, the nobles. Here's the thing. 
Pride destroys destiny. Pride will destroy the destiny that God has called you to in your life. I've entitled my message this morning just that, Pride Destroys Destiny. Pride destroys destiny. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the number that's on the screen. You can also download the Journey app. And uh, all you got to do is go to the app store, search Journey Church Jacksonville to download the app, and uh, you'll have my notes. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak this morning. Holy Spirit, we come this morning. We're asking you, God, just to speak to our hearts. We come humbly today, God, realizing that, Jesus, none of us are walking fully and completely all the way in this subject, God. But, Lord, I pray that, God, that you would help us. We come humbly today and we ask for you, Lord, just to speak to us, Jesus. Lord, this is so important. Lord, would you get rid of any pride in our lives, Jesus? We begin to understand that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. That our confidence, it doesn't come through just mustering up the feeling of confidence, God. It comes from realizing that we are fully, have to be fully surrendered to you, Jesus. So I pray that today, God, we would do completely that. I pray for the parts of our lives, God, that are not of you. Lord, that you would shape them and, God, you would mold them. That, God, we would be like you, Father. Lord, get rid of the pride, God, in our life. Lord, this is a difficult message this morning, but God, I pray that, Lord, you would take your Logos word this morning and you would make it rhema, make it alive in our hearts, God. Lord, we say to you today, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I don't understand how this is uh, possible, but in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it says that Moses was the most humble man who walked the earth. They're putting it on the screen right now. I'm kind of paraphrasing. Mom, uh, Moses was the most humble man who walked the earth. Now, what you need to know about the Bible is we, I hope we can all agree to this, that the Bible is 100% God-breathed. It is infallible. It is a, a fact. Like, there, there is nothing that can come against this phrase. But what is incredible about this, let me ask you this question. Who wrote the book of Numbers? Anybody know? Moses wrote the book of Numbers. So just think about this. I, 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 this is mind-blowing to me that Mo, the Holy Spirit allowed Moses to write this statement that Moses was the most humble man who walked the planet. I mean, just, I, I don't even understand how Moses can get to that place where he's able to pin that and yet not allow pride in his life. It's mind-blowing. But yet he was able to do that. Because we would look at Moses and say, hey, Moses, you wrote that down. Like, what's going on? Like, you're not really, you're full of pride right now. You're not really humble. Just in that statement, right? But he was the most humble man, and he was still able to pin that verse. Here's one of the biggest things about pride. Pride is the most difficult form of idolatry to discern in yourself because the idol is yourself. Let me read that again. Pride is the most difficult form of idolatry to discern in yourself because the idol is yourself. Pride is hard to spot because it can be a stronghold in your life. And so this is what I want to do this morning. I don't want any of us to miss out on supernatural building. When I say supernatural building, because anything that God does is supernatural, right? He does the, he's the God of the impossible. He's a God who does over and beyond what we could ever imagine or think. And so anytime God does build, it's supernatural. I don't want any of us to miss out on what God is doing here, but also in your life, because I believe he's building your life supernaturally as well. And so I want to give you four things about pride this morning that I've learned in my life. The first thing I want to give you this morning is the problem with pride is where it's all started. The problem with pride is where it started. What makes pride so dangerous is where it started. Even more specifically, who started it? Ezekiel 28, 17. This is speaking of Satan. It says this. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. 
I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You know, Jesus in Luke uh, chapter 10, all the disciples are really, really excited because they saw the power of Jesus and uh, demons were cast out and they came to Jesus so excited and so pumped up. And Jesus says to them, you know what? I saw Satan fall like lightning which is a corroborating verse with these two, uh, Isaiah 14, 12 as well. Verse 12, how you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. The name Lucifer means son of the morning. It brings bright one. It means, um, it, it means shining star. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart. Now listen, so Ezekiel 28 shows us pride started with Satan, but Isaiah 14 shows us what Satan's pride looked like. Let's keep reading. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. How many know there's only one most high? There's only one most high, and Satan, he was trying to get to the place where God was. It makes me think of Revelation 22, 16, the second to last statement that Jesus makes in the Bible. The last statement is this, I'm coming soon, I'm paraphrasing right there. But the second to last statement is Jesus said, I am the bright and morning star. In other words, Jesus is telling Satan in that moment, listen, You might try to mimic me, you try try to be like me, but you're just a fake. You're just a pretender. I alone and in the bright morning star, there is no one else who can come against me. Jesus is making a stand in that moment. You're just a pretender. You might can have my nickname. You might think that you're trying to be like me, but you're not. I and the bright morning star. Satan said, I will be like the God most high. This pride caused his fall from heaven. Here's another way to putting it. Lucifer was the first narcissist. (laughs) Lucifer was the first narcissist. (laughs) Now, when you hear that word narcissist, doesn't it just kind of make your skin crawl? I mean, like, this gives me the EBGBs all over. Like, narcissist. I don't want anything to do with the spirit of pride. I don't want anything to do with the spirit of narcissism. We can't have anything to do with that, with that spirit, amen? amen? Because what will happen is eventually we will fall just like Lucifer fell. And what he's trying to do is because his pride caused him to fall, is he's trying to flip us the bill. He's trying to make us fall too just because as he fell. Satan is trying to do everything he possibly can to get you to fall the way he fell. Let's go to the next point this morning. The danger of pride is what Satan can do with it. The danger with pride is what Satan can do with it. Now here's probably the scariest thought that I'll say today. Everywhere that Satan is welcome, I'm sorry, everywhere that pride is welcome, Satan is working. Another way of saying it is everywhere that pride is, Satan is. You know, I've taken the bait in my life personally, hook, line, and sinker before. I've walked in that before. I think that we partner with the enemy far more than we'd like to admit. Here's what Satan does with our pride. He can dethrone God in your heart. The danger of pride is not just that it seeks to enthrone you in your life to try to make you look good. The biggest danger of pride is in so doing that it seeks to dethrone God in your heart. Psalm 10.4. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. God is in none of his thoughts. This is dangerous. We all fight this. Not one one 
person among us can never say that we've never had a prideful thought before. Because in the moment, if you say that, man, you just had one. The thing is this, Satan tries to get me to worship me. Because if I worship me, I'm not worshiping him. When that happens, you're no threat to Satan. You're ineffective for the kingdom of God. You begin to think that you can do it without God and without others around you. You know, when I was a young worship pastor, uh, I've been in full-time vocational ministry since I was 20 years old, so 18 years now. And when I first started, I made the incredible mistake of thinking that I didn't really need people around me. I had a ton of opportunities, and God gave me a ton of favor, and I was able to lead worship for different conferences where there was, um, you know, a thousand teenagers just worshiping and going after God. But I made the mistake of not bringing the people that God entrusted me with well around me. Did I, did I do an okay job? Maybe. But I didn't do the best job that God was really calling me to. I made the mistake of thinking that I could do it all on my own without people around me. We need people around us, don't we? I got a, a word about six years ago. How many of you know the pr- pr- prophetic, you can either accept it or reject it, yeah? But I got a word of correction from the Lord. In it, they told me that God had more for me when it came to worship, but I missed out because I didn't really build the people around me. But God was going to give me another opportunity to build with people And I got to a place in ministry, I felt like, where I got to a place of burnout because I was trying to do it all on my own. I was trying to force it. I was trying to do it all on my own. And what ends up happening when you begin to do things on your own without partnering with God is you get burnt out. And then what happens is you lose your peace. You see, pride leads you to losing your peace. When I was leading worship one time, the, uh, the person speaking at this conference, it was a youth conference, looked back at me, and they were taking up an offering for, um, for, for missions. And so it was a good cause, everything else, and I guess they really, really desired to, to really bless the missionaries. But they looked back at me, and they said this, hey, hey, can you play a money song? And I was like, a money song? Like, what are you talking about? I can't, I can't play a money song. Like, uh, what is uh, and they looked at the crowd and they said, hey, I want you to get to the teenagers. And we had already encountered God in this incredible way. The Holy Spirit was in that place. And they looked at everyone and said, hey, I want you to give every single dime that's in your pocket. And I'm not judging right now. I'm just discerning from my spirit. It's like in that moment the Holy Spirit left the room. You see, any time that pride walks on the stage, God walks off of it. You see, any time that pride is in your life, it doesn't matter if it's at your job or a different situation, any time you have a prideful moment, God walks out in that moment. He can't be where pride is. So two things from this story. When pride walks onto the stage, God walks off of it, and pride destroys peace in your life because you're trying to do it all on your own. Number three, there are promises from God based on if you walk in pride. There are promises from God based on if you walk in pride. Now, these promises, these types of promises are not promises that you want. Say, I don't want these promises. Come on, just say that loud. I don't want these promises. Here are the promises I'm going to tell you. Pride leads to destruction. It's a promise from God. We don't want these promises. Pride leads to destruction. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. You want to know why Satan tries to lift you up in pride? Because then when you fall, it's a farther distance to fall. It hurts more. You know, it seems in the, in the natural that the American church, just looking at statistics, that it's much less effective than it used to be. The amount of people who are going to church nowadays, the amount of people who are getting saved within the American church... It's on the decline, sadly. But I believe that God God in these last days is going to restore something. 
But the reason why that is is because the church doesn't seem that we're unified like we should be. Yeah? There's a, this unification of, I'm not, I'm not even talking about within our church here, Journey Church. I'm talking about the church, the greater C church. Because it seems like we're in competition and we're fighting against one another. I'll tell you what, I don't want to be in competition with other church. We're brothers and sisters in Christ and we're building the kingdom of God together. We can't allow pride or even we can't allow theology to, to cause us to think that we're better than one another. I'm here to tell you this morning that, hey, I do my best with my theology, but I don't got it all figured out. I have certain stances that I really believe that God has shown me, but I'll tell you what, I don't have it all figured out perfectly. You know, I believe in the full gifts of, of the Spirit. I believe in the full gifts of Spirit, but just because another brother and sister doesn't, doesn't mean I have to dislike them or not work with them to further the gospel, amen? And some people are Calvinist, some people are Armenian, some people have the same words that you don't, some people don't even, like it doesn't matter. What matters is Christ died, he rose again on the third day, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and that should unify us as churches to work together. You know what fires me up right now more than anything else? I joined a cohort, cohort with other pastors and we meet the third Thursday of every month. And the most beautiful thing, it's all, all the, a lot of pastors in the Orange Park area, the most beautiful thing is happening. It doesn't matter if they're, if they're Baptists, different backgrounds, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter if Methodists, it doesn't matter. Like, it, it does not matter. We get together, we gather together, we encourage one another. But we're coming together and literally we have plans. We're going to lay out a map and begin to pray over Orange Park and Jacksonville and asking the Lord just to give us the ability to reach every single neighborhood, every single person for the gospel. Despite our backgrounds, despite different beliefs, I mean, that fires me up inside. That's the type of thing that the church needs to do to be unified together. We can't allow pride to separate us. We can't allow different uh, beliefs and different theology to separate us. It's about coming together. I, I don't know if you remember Woody who was here uh, last month and he has software that you can actually see all the different neighborhoods to actually be strategic and outreaches. I can kind of picture us as a group like going and saying, hey, you go after this neighborhood as a church. You go after this neighborhood. You go after this group of people. Let's go after uh, people for the kingdom of God because lives are at stake. Amen. It's a beautiful thing when we come together and not allow pride to separate us. Pride, number two this morning, pride always leads to being humiliated. Second thing, second promise. Pride always leads to being humiliated. Proverbs 29, 23, pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. It doesn't get any simpler than that, does it? If you press the pride button, it's going to end in embarrassment every time. Proverbs 25, 7. It's better to wait for an invitation to the head table than be sent away in public disgrace. Pride always leads to disgrace. And here's what happens with ambition. We'll move forward in something and we'll think that because God has called us to do it that we've got to do it right then. I said this a couple weeks back that you can be called but not sent yet. And so we'll try to get a, a, a seat at the king's table and it's not God's timing. And what ends up happening because we're forcing the doors down is it ends in embarrassment because it wasn't God's timing yet. It's better to wait for a decade for God's promise and his timing than to push down the doors yourself. Wait for God's timing. Here's the third thing. Pride creates a distance between God and me. Psalm 138.6, this is a very scary verse for my pride in my life. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. When I'm focused on me, I can't abide in Christ. When I'm focused on myself and what I want and what I desire instead of just putting my attention and my affection on God, I can't abide in him. And I'm no longer doing life around his presence. 
And you might say, Adam, his presence is everywhere. Yes, that's what David talked about. Where can I go from his presence? If I go up to the heavens, he's there. If I go down to Sheol, he's there. I'm talk- that's the omnipresence of God. But what I'm talking about this morning is the manifest presence of God. Wherever pride is, the manifest presence of God cannot be. You know, we have to be people who rely on God in every single uh, aspect of our lives. We have to rely on the people around us. For me, we have an incredible leadership team here. We have a group of overseers who help oversee the church. There's three of them, our founding pastor, Pastor Eric Bishop, and we're underneath the covering of Gateway Church, and they give me a pastor to speak into my life, to call me up once a month, say, hey, Adam, how's things going? Like, we all need a covering. We all need help around us, amen? We have an incredible group of elders. We have an incredible group of staff. We have all these things in place of of trustees who are financial in nature. I cannot do it myself. We need those incredible leaders around us to help build. But we also need you as well, right? And so as we come together, we're not coming together uh, looking at other people's giftings and saying I'm better than you or anything like that. We're walking humility without pride and so everyone can be a part of building supernaturally for the kingdom of God. The nobles, they thought they were too good to build for the walls. We can't be too good. It's time for us to get our hands dirty and get to the work that God has called us into. Amen? We have to rely on the people around us and rely on God more importantly. We have to be able to hear the voice of God and be sensitive to his leading, his direction. Number four this morning. The last thing. There is a way to overcome pride. Amen? There is a way, church, to overcome pride. We all struggle with pride, including myself. I'm not above this this morning. We all struggle with pride, but there is a way to overcome pride. To overcome pride, the first thing I want to give you, to overcome pride, you have to exalt God. You have to exalt God. One of my favorite moments in the entire Bible is when David gave this incredible offering to the Lord. Like it's just, it's over the top uh, sacrifice to the Lord. And he could have very easily said, man, uh, look at me, I'm so incredible, look what I've done for God, I've given him so much. He could have received the glory, received the honor. Hey, David has, uh, Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain his ten thousands. He walked in humility, yet people around him were saying stuff like that. He gave his sacrifice, and yet he gave God all the glory. First Chronicles 29, 11. He wasn't cocky when he gave this sacrifice. He gave it back to God. He says this, blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. The fastest way, guys, to kill pride in your life is just to exalt God. It's to worship him. Lord, you're so good. Lord, I just humble myself before you. It's just to give him all the worship and the glory that he's due. Amen. The second thing I want to give you to kill pride is this. To overcome pride, you have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself. We can lose everything with pride. Satan lost everything with pride. But the only thing that we lose with humility is pride. You can lose everything with pride, but the only thing you lose with humility is pride. Now, I'm not talking about humiliation this morning because we are seated in high places. We are the head, not the tail. But our flesh, we have to kill our flesh, kill the desires of what is in this earthly body and humble ourselves before him. Let me read something uh, kind of funny to you. Job 25. It's a little bit funny, not, not all the way, but verse 5. If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure, in his eyes, how much less a mortal who is but a maggot, a human being who is only a worm. You know, I'm not advocating with that that we come before the Lord in the mornings and we're saying, God, here I am, just a maggot. Lord, here I am, just a worm. I'm not advocating that, but what I am saying this morning is this. 
that our flesh, it belongs on the ground. Our flesh, our earthly desires, it belongs here on the ground. You know my, I've said this, I've been in vocational ministry now for 18 years. My goal for the next 18 years is to go low. Our goal has to go low. That we would humble ourselves before God. That we wouldn't have pride. That every single part of who we are would be fully surrendered to him. Lord, kill our flesh. Kill every desire in our heart that is not of you. We act so often out of what we want, out of what we desire. We try to push down doors that aren't ready to be, uh, that aren't God's timing. And we don't humble ourselves before the Lord. I'm guilty, y'all. But we have to understand that God is calling us to a place of humility. If we want to be a people that hosts the presence of God, it starts here. It starts on our knees before God. It starts humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of the Lord. In James it says, humble yourself before God and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. We don't have to force being lifted up, but it comes from being fully and completely surrendered before God. That's my goal. That's my goal, to kill my pride. Because how can he have a seat on this stage if I've stolen it? How can he be the center of attention if I've stolen it? We have a saying on our worship team, presence over performance. His presence is everything. Who cares about the way we look? 